Okay. Hi. So today we have Kathy from uh, Dartmouth, and she'll be talking about the Chinese game for permutations and the Markov chain variation. Before we begin, we have our few guidelines, which are we are all learning. Everyone has something to contribute, and no one has all the answers. And with that, Kathy, take it away. Thank you for the introduction. So um, this is my um, this is project and it's joint work with my advisor Sergio Lizode. So today I'll talk about first of all what's a penny scam, and then how we um, modified it to be penny scam for permutations. We also have um, a Markov chain variation for our penny scam for permutations. So let's start with penny scam. So this is a game between two players, um, Tom and Jerry. They volunteer to play this game and win a free bulva. But so um, we first have Tom select a binary word of length greater than or equal to three, say um, HHH. And Jerry selects another binary word of the same length, say THH in this case. And we um, flip a fair coin rapidly and write down their outcomes. Until we see one of uh, the player's words shows up as a consecutive subword, which in this case will just determine that Jerry wins the game. It's known that for any words picked by Tom, the first player, um, Jerry as a second player can always select a word um, that's more likely to show up first. And the exact odds of winning can be computed using Conway's algorithms. So um, we're thinking of, okay, what if instead of words, we ask Tom and Jerry to pick permutations? So this is our Pentagon for permutation set up. Um, we've asked Tom to pick a permutations of any length k greater than equal to three. And then Jerry picks another permutation of the same length. After that, um, we generate numbers, uh, real numbers uniformly randomly from zero to one and records their relative orders. For example, this is the, the first number we generate. The second number we generate is smaller than the first one. So these two numbers form a two one, their relative order is two one, right? And then the third number we have is smaller than the first number, but then bigger than the second number. So this three number forms a relative order of three, one, two. Together with the fourth one, we form a relative order of four, one, three, two. So we keep generating numbers and write down the relative orders on two. So here, um, this permutation six, two, five, three, one, four, ends with a three, one, four, which is of relative order two, one, three, which is the permutation that's chosen by Jerry. So um, Jerry wins again. Um, make sense? So we're curious about, <laughs> thanks. So um, we're curious about if there's any um, properties that we can study for this penitent for permutations. Um, in particular, if there's also a winning strategy for the second players or just for arbitrary pairs of permutations, which one's more likely to win, okay? So the first result, um, the theorem I'm going to talk about today is the probability of seeing one pattern before another. So for two permutations sigma and tau of length k, we denote it by this a v sub n to the sigma of sigma and tau, the set of permutations in S n that ends with sigma, which is the um, superscript here, and avoid both sigma and tau elsewhere. Then the probability that sigma shows up before tau, which I which we write this probability of sigma precede tau will just be sum up um, the probability that game, the game ends at length n times the probability that um, sigma shows up before tau given that the game ends at n. And it can be simplified to this formula here. So now in order to compute the probability that sigma shows up before tau, it's now sufficient to just compute um, the number of permutations that end with sigma and avoid both sigma and tau elsewhere. Okay, and also from this theorem, we can say um, if we have a bijection between these two sets, right? So between um, the set of permutations that end with sigma and avoid sigma and tau elsewhere, 
and the set of permutations end with tau and works among tau elsewhere, then we can say um, these two permutations are equally likely to show up first. And we say, in this case, sigma and tau are a tied pair. Okay. So um, from there, we can we have um, the first tied pair. Let iota k to be the increasing permutation and sigma to be the almost increasing permutation, except for this i here. So this is iota, um, the increasing permutation, and this is sigma that's almost increased, except that there is a, an i at the end. Then we say um, the these two permutations, iota and sigma, are a tied pair. So from this corollary here, we need to find a bijection between um, the set of permutations that end with iota k and avoid both iota k and sigma and um, the set of permutations that end with sigma and avoid both iota k and sigma. So the permutation, sorry, the bijection we construct is we basically um, given like any permutation in the first set, it will look like this, right? And um, so we simply map this i to the very end. It will form a permutation that ends with sigma and it will avoid both sigma and alta k because um, if it has an alta k, then it means the entries before the one here will need to be less than one, but it will form an alta k in the previous case as well. And it will not it will not form a sigma because we don't have enough like length to do like an up and then a decrement. So um, this is a proof. And the second pair we have, we need to um, use this definition of non-overlapping because we figure that in order to find um, the bijection between two sets, sometimes it's helpful for us to learn um, the similarities between two permutations. And here we evaluate the similarities by evaluating how they can be overlapped and non-overlapped with each other and with themselves. So um, given two permutations, we said sigma and tau are non-j overlapping if there's no um, such i within between j and k minus one, such that the last um, i entries of sigma is the same relative order as the first i entries of tau, or if the if there's no i uh, such that the last i entries of tau is the same relative order as the first i entries of sigma. And um, sigma is said to be non-j self-overlapping if it's just, it didn't have like the, uh, the, um, the start and the end of sigma, it didn't overlap with each other, okay? And we say, however, if they do overlap in um, j positions, we have this, the, the first i entries of tau is the same as the last i entries of sigma. Then we say um, sigma overlaps tau in i positions. And here are some examples that we say 2, 1, 4, 3, this permutation overlaps 3, 1, 4, uh, 3, 1, 2, 4 in two positions because 2, 1, 4, 3 end with a 4, 3, which is of relative order 2, 1. And 3, 1, 2, 4 start with 3, 1, which is of relative order 2, 1. So we say these two permutations overlaps in two positions, but there are non three overlap, um, non three overlapping because um, the last three entries and the first three entries of tau and sigma, they simply don't match. Okay. I had a sorry. Question. Yeah, sure. Um, the st function that is mm -hmm. the flattening function. What does that stand for? Oh, sorry. So uh, this is the relative order. So say okay. st of 4, 3 is we um, replace the smallest number by 1 and mm -hmm. the second smallest number by 2. Okay. So right. let's say, yeah, st of 4, 3 would just be a 2, 1 mm -hmm. because 3 is the smallest is 1 and then 4 is the second smallest number. And the relative, um, so the, the st of 3, 1 will also be a 2, 1. Right. So yeah. So we say um, they have the same relative order. Thanks. Makes sense. 
Thank you for the question. Um, so with this definition of overlapping and non-overlapping, we now have the second theorem says, if we have two permutations, sigma and tau, um, they have the same first i entries. And they are non-j plus one overlapping. And each of sigma and j are non-j plus one self-overlapping then they also form a tight pair. So um, one example is this 2, 4, 5, 1, 3, and 2, 4, 5, 3, 1. So their first three entries are the, the same. So in this case, sigma i and tau i are the same for i between 1 and 3, right? So j is 3 here. And um, sigma and tau are known for overlapping because uh, say like two four five two four five one is not the same relative order of four five three one for example. So they are known for overlapping, and they are also known for self overlapping. And then by the theorem we say okay these two um, permutations form the tie. And again we want to show that there is a bijection between sorry I um I should change this it's not um I also can sigma it's now. Um, the bijection between um, the set of permutations that end with this should be a tau here, and with tau and avoid both tau and sigma elsewhere, and the set of permutations that end with a sigma and avoid bo both tau and sigma elsewhere. Um, I would say the proof goes like we want to, given the permutation that end with for example, in this case, two, four, five, one, three. We want to rearrange this last five entries so that it's in two, four, five, three, one, right? So given a permutation that ends with this number, this end with this permutation, we arrange it so that it ends with the second permutation here. And such a rearrangement will not create a two, four, five, one, three and two, four, five, three, one because they have the same um, first three entries, and we're only changing the last two numbers. So um, if if we'll create um, either a sigma or tau after the arrangement, this sigma or tau will show up in uh, before rearranging it as well. So uh, this is just a very um, brief sketch of proof. Okay. And also we have um, for any k greater than or equal to 4, if sigma is 1k alpha, which alpha is any permutations of 2 to k minus 3, and k minus 2, k minus 1, and we have another permutation 1k beta, where beta is another permutation of 2 to k minus 3, and followed by a k minus 2 and k, then we said these two permutations also form a tight pair. So for example, if k equals to seven, then sigma is one, seven, the permutation of two, three, four, and five, six, which um, should be tied with one, six, a permutation of two, three, four, and five, seven. So um, the proof is similar to the proof with this theorem, except that we need to first argue that any permutations any pairs of permutations in these forms, they can overlap with each other and with itself. No, they can overlap with each other. Yep, and with itself with um at most two positions. Okay, so um for example, one k and two minus k two, and k minus two and k they overlap in um, two positions. And we want to say that they cannot be overlapped in three positions. And then the rest proof will be similar to the proof of the previous theorem. Okay. Um, but in general, it's still an open question to um, characterize all tight pairs. We only provided um, some conditions here. And using the theorem, sorry. Using this theorem, we're able to compute the complete table of all pairs of permutations of like three. 
And note that、um, the winning relations is not transitive, which means the probability one two three shows up before two one three is less than half, which means two three one is more likely to show up before one two three, right? And then three two one is more likely to show up before two one three, but it doesn't necessarily imply that three two one. It's more likely to show up before、uh, one, two, three. Actually, one, two, three, and three, two, one form a tied pair here. So if we have like permutation A,、um, it's more likely to win than B, and B is more likely to win than C. It doesn't really mean A will win C. Okay, this is、um, the non-transitivity for pentagon for permutations. Um. I don't have time to go through all details in this table, but we are able to at least compute.、Uh, sorry, I'm able to at least show you two formulas to compute the probability that one three two shows up before two three one.、Um, it's this number here, and we need to use the recurrence form for and the generating function to compute the probability that one two three shows up before two one three, which is、um, this number here. And we also have a table for all pairs of length four.、Um, the blue cells represents the probability greater than or equal to half. So, for example, this blue cell here means it's more likely to see one, two, three, four than two, three, four, one. And the magenta,、uh, this cell here, means it's more likely to see two, three, one, four. Than a one two three four, and all the blue cells means、um, these two permutations form a tied pair. So, for example, here one two three four and one two four three is equally likely to show up first. So,、um, I think there are in total eleven, not count. Yes,、oh, um, counting the. Um, complement as well,、um, pairs of tied, yeah, pairs of、um, tied pairs, and we were able to prove most of them using the previous theorems and their corollaries, except for very special case that the probability for two one three four to show up before three two four one is、um, a half. So there seems to be no、um, simple bijection between these two、um, these two sets. So、um, in order to show the number of set, the number of element that ends with two one three four and avoid both permutations, is the same as the number of, the number of permutations that end with three two four one and, and avoid both. We um. We first prove a, a little bit more specific、um, equation here. So we know we not only want the permutation to end with two one three four and avoid this. We also condition that、um, pi one is a and pi two and pi n is b. Then we say it's the same number of permutations that end with three two four one, and start with n plus one minus n. Minus a and n with an n plus one minus b. Okay, and if we take、um, the complement of the second set here, this is the same as we have the permutations that end with two, three, one, four, and start with an n. Sorry, start with an a and end with a b. And in order to prove this, we prove that the first set.、Um, Has n total occurrences of these two patterns, and start with an A and end with the B. It's the same as the permutations that has m occurring occurrences of these two patterns, and start with an A, A and end with a B. And still, there's no a simple bijection for these two sets. So、um, we need to actually use inclusion exclusion set to prove this theorem. Okay. And we also have a conjecture for the winning 
strategy for the second player. So we said, um, if Tom picks Sigma, then a winning strategy for Jerry will be to move the last digit to the first one. So pick Sigma K, Sigma 1, Sigma 2, so on and so forth, to Sigma K minus 1. This is inspired by um, Hennis game for words. So I think um, in the original, in the original penis game, the winning strategy is similar that you, you pick um, the first K minus one letters that picked by the first player. And then you, uh, you will need to insert a letter to the front by some um, strategies. Okay. Then is the Markov chain variation for penis game for permutations. So, um, we still ask Tom and Jerry to pick permutations, but after they pick permutations, um, the game will start um, in any permutation of length k, where k is the permutation, the length of the permutation that picks by Tom and Jerry. So the game will start um, from any permutation of length k with probability one over k factorial. Now at each step, we delete the very first number and then we add a number which is choose, uh, chosen uniformly randomly from one to k, add to the end. So if we delete this one, the remaining two digit three, two forms a relative number two, one. And with probability one third, we will generate a one and we add at the back of two, one. And then, then we increase um, any numbers that's greater than or equal to this one by one. So we get a three, two, one. And with probability one third, we will receive a two and we'd increase the number that's greater than or equal to two by one. So we will increase this two by one, which gives us a three, one, two. And with probability one third, we will receive a three and there's no number greater than or equal to three, right? So we will just get a two, one, three. So um, starting from one, three, two, we have one third probability to get a three, two, one, a one third prob probability to get a three, one, two, and, and another one third probability to get a two, one, three. It's not possible to go from one, three, two to one, two, three in one step because they don't have the same start and end. Okay. So um, alternatively, we can have um, this, a Markov chain set up for this version. So after Tom and Jerry pick their permutation of length k, we will have our sample space is just all permutations of length k. And at each step, it's possible to go from sigma um, to tau if the relative order of the last k minus 1 um, numbers is the same as the relative order of the k minus 1 numbers in tau. So for example, one, two, three end with a one, two, right? So the, the relative order of two, three is one, two. So it's possible for one, two, three to go to any permutations that start with a one, two. So for example, it can go to itself because one, two, three start with a one, two. It can go to, it can go to one, three, two because it also start with a one, two and also go to two, three, one, okay? And the second example, let's say, we know, we're now at one, three, two. So one, three, two end with a two, one. So we can go to all permutations that start with a two, one. For example, a two, one, three, or a three, two, one, or a three, one, two. It's not possible for it to go to any other three permutations. Okay. So we're able to um, draw a Markov chain according to the rule we just mentioned. And we start with any permutation, say one, three, two, with probability one, six in this case. And then we just walk along the Markov chain um, until we hit some patterns for the first time, which happen to be um, either Tom or Jerry's pattern. Okay. And we're able to, because we have a Markov chain, we're able to write down the transition matrix so um, the entries here, for example, means if we are now at state one, two, three, with probability one, two, three, we can go back to one, two, three self. 
with probability one two uh one third we will get back to one three two and with probability one third we'll go to two three one it's not possible to go to any other three permutations so we put zeros here um this is yeah the formal definition so in general um pij will represent that um we can go from the sigma to tau where sigma is uh, like the permutation in the ith row and j is the permutation in the j column okay and we defined a special transition matrix with respect to sigma by um, deleting the sigma row and replace it with an all zero row. Okay. So by doing this, we are basically deleting all the outgoing edges from one, two, three. So by deleting, by replacing the one, two, three row by um, an all zero row, we're basically yeah, deleting all the outgoing edges. And to do so, we're able to compute the heating time, which is the expected time to see a pattern for the first time. Um, intuitively, we don't want, so once we hit this one, two, three for the first time, and we'll just end the game. So um, we don't want it to go out again. So this is why we're deleting um, all the outgoing edges and also re uh, replace the, the, the row by an all zero row. But formally, um, because of the formula of expected time, it's equivalent to um, find the probability that the game will arrive at sigma in the ith step for the first time. So, um, uh, note that this is the transition matrix uh, with respect to one, two, three. And all the entries here represent starting from, um, say, this permutation one, three, two. Then we have probability one third to go to two, one, three in one step, right? And if we square it, then the entries will represent, so this one knife here, for example, we represent starting from one, three, two the probability to go to two, one, three in two steps, right? So um, if we raise it by um, the power of i, the entries will just represent starting from uh, the permutation represents by the row. In i step, we will um, hit the, the permutation that represents by the columns, right? So um, we want to know the um, the, the expected time to go to say one to three. So we want to sum up all the entries in the column. That's why we uh, multiply an E sigma uh, transpose here. And plugging this, we will have our formula for the expected time, the heating time, the sigma. Okay. And I want to, after we have um, our heating time, we want to talk about like equivalence patterns. So um, we need to first define a special set of walk, so-called good walk. So this is um, walks of length i that end at sigma and avoid sigma elsewhere. So it's like we arrive at sigma for the first time, right? And um, we also have a formula to compute the number of such walks the end at sigma and avoid sigma elsewhere. Okay. And from there, we can say, if we have two patterns, they have the same number of good walks, then they are in the same equivalence class. Because after we have um, a formula for good walks, we can rewrite the expected time in terms of the number of good walks. So if they have the same number of walks, then um, they have the same heating time. And so they're in the same equivalent class. Okay. So then we have um, three conditions for two patterns to be um, in the same equivalent class. First of all, if they are complement of each other, or if they are reverse of each other, or um, if they satisfy that um, the first k minus one entries of a sigma 
of of sigma is the same as so they basically have the same start and the same end then we say they also in the semi equivalence class and we conjecture that these are the only three conditions or the combination of any of three conditions are the only um, conditions for two patterns to be equivalent. Okay, so now, so next I'm going to show how you get um, the theorem. So co um, complement gives equivalence patterns because remember if we have tau, it's tau one to tau k, then tau complement will just be k plus one minus tau one to k plus one minus tau k. So if we have um, an edge from sigma to tau, then it means the last k minus one entries will be in the same relative order of the of the first k minus one entries in tau. So if we take the complement, we still have uh, the equation here. So basically, we're saying if we have an edge from sigma to tau, then we'll also have an edge from sigma complement to, to tau complement. So um, if we have a good walk that starts from sigma and end with tau, um, then uh, we can just take the complement of all the intermediate um, um, permutations and form sigma complement to tau complement. Okay. So by doing this, we have a bijection between the good walks that ending at tau and good walks ending at tau complement. And because of the result we mentioned before, this gives us a equivalent pattern. Um, so for the reversal, it will be easier if our Markov chain is a reversible Markov chain. So we can simply just reverse all the walks and then find a bijection between the good walks that ending at tau and good walks ending at tau reverse. But unfortunately, this is not a reversible Markov chain. So um, in order to prove the result here, we need to introduce another set of walks, which is uh, what we call bad walks, which are walks of length i that start and end with sigma and avoid sigma elsewhere. And um, so it's possible to extend a good walk to a bad walk by adding a sigma in front. But it's not always doable because that requires um, the last k minus one entries of sigma is the same as the first k minus one entries of the start of the good walk, right? But it's possible to extend from a good walk to a bad walk. And this is why we have um, where we get the uh, how we get the um, the formula for the number of good walks here. We replace the first um, transition matrix with re with respect to sigma by a, a transition matrix minus the transition matrix with re with respect to sigma. And after we have um, the definition for bad walks, note that all good walks, sorry, all walks end at one, three, two. Uh, it's an example. Um, can be decomposed by a good walk, which can be empty, followed by a sequence of bad walks, um, which can also be empty. So um, because of this, and we have k to the i, total number of walks that ends at any sigma, right? So it will then be um, sum up all the um, the joining functions with coefficients the number of good walks times um, this expression here. For which you're saying that in order to show that they um, tau and tau reverse has have the same number of good walks, we can instead prove that tau and tau reverse have the same number of bad walks. And because they both have k to the i number of walks that end at tau or tau reverse, um, we'll then be able to prove the number of good walks are the same. Okay, so to show that there's a bijection between a uh, number of bad walks and with a permutation and, and with its reverse, um, say given a bad walk of sigma, then 
um, we will have another bad walk that end with a salt and end with sigma reverse by reversing all the intermediate um, permutations. In this case, um, we will then have the same number of bad walks for sigma and sigma reverse. And because of that, they have the same uh, number of good walks and then have the same number, uh, have the same uh, expecting the same heating time. Okay. And well, reverse complement is just a combination of the previous two theorems. Um, the, the third condition here is if two permutations, they have the same start and the same ends, they're in the same coolant class. And the sketch of the proof is we're basically just copying all the intermediate um, uh, intermediate permutations because they have the same end. So if we can go from sigma to an alpha, then we can also go from a tau to alpha. And because they have the same start, if we can go from any um, beta or gamma to sigma, then we can also go from this exact permutation to, uh, to tau. So um, we have a bijection between um, bad walks that end with sigma and bad walks end with tau. So therefore, because of the same reason, we have um, that sigma and tau have the same uh, heating time. Okay. And now we're ready to compute the winning probabilities for any two pairs of um, pair terms of the same length. So um, here we have a formula for um, I put a transcript an M here just to to distinguish this with the win, with the probability in the Markov chain in the Penske for permutations, so not the Markov chain version. Um, so how do we get this formula? So basically, the number the probability to see sigma before tau is um, similarly we sum up probability that the game ends at i times um, sigma shows up before tau conditioning on um, the game ends at i. And we can represent the probability by the formulas um, with respect to the number of good walks and uh, plug in the formula for good walks. We will have this formula here. So um, then we have three conditions um, for two um, pairs to be a tight pair, which means uh, sigma and tau have equal probability to show up first. So if sigma and tau are complement to each other, then they form a tight pair. Or if they have the same start, then they're also tight. Or if there exists a third pattern that um, the third pattern gamma has the same start with tau and then gamma is tau with um, sigma. Okay. And we conjecture that these three conditions are the only conditions for two, or like the combination of these three conditions are the only conditions for two patterns to be um, tau. And we also have a conjecture that the monotone patterns never wins. So um, if sigma is either iota k, the increasing permutation, or rho k, the decreasing permutation, and tau is any other permutations, then the probability that sigma shows up before tau is always less than or equal to half. And um, this is uh, true on to, up to n, on, n equals to um, 6, I think. We don't, have, um, we don't have enough time to run out all like um, length 7 pairs. Um, and then we also have a conjecture that if sigma um, can go to tau, but tau cannot go to sigma, then sigma will never lose. So we conjecture a non-losing strategy for the second player. 
Okay. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the talk. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, I suppose I have. I don't know if the writing, if it's a question, some questions, it's kind of unclear to me exactly what I have. Um, but so the original goal of this was, or the motivation was, you know, can Jerry always find a permutation that beats Tom? Mm -hmm. um, and then you had a lot of work in saying like, well, can you find ties? But with the interest in the Jerry finding a permutation that beats Tom, um what ha, how far have you looked into this and what are the kinds of techniques you've been trying in order to you, you have some conjectures on these mm -hmm. options have you tried proving them have you had techniques that you think are promising or techniques that you thought were promising but now don't work but no don't work so yeah so um for the um uh, the the original pen scan the permutation where is this yep um so originally Sergio and i i think we underestimated the difficulties of this problem and we thought we can just um modify the proof for so i mentioned before that we have a convex formula a, con a convex algorithm to compute the um, the winning probability for the for the for the, for the very original words case. Mm -hmm. So thinking of okay, we can probably just modify the proof and then um, just prove for the permutations. Sure. But then I would say one of the difficulties, I would say probably the main one is um, in the in the words case, we can simply combine say this H H H and a T H H and gives us a unique word H H H mm -hmm. T H H. But in permutations, even though we just combined a permutation one, two, and a two, one, we have like four choose two resulting permutations. So we don't have a unique um, unique result for like combining permutations. And this is like something that's been used in two or three proofs of Conway's algorithms. So we were like, okay, probably this one doesn't work. And we're trying to then find just like other ways to prove um, but we don't even have a general formula for the probability for any pairs of sigma and tau. This mm -hmm. is why uh, we only have a conjecture because we have a complete table for yeah, like length three and length four, but then up to but then like starting from length five is too much um, for us to to compute. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a conjecture because we don't have um, a formula to compute any pairs of any length. And um, we doubt if there is actually a formula because we can see from this table that, oh, like this number here, this is not even a rational number, which is different from um, the original mm -hmm. um, uh, pen scan for like words. Right. And even though just for length three, we use bijections to prove like those type pairs and then like generating functions to prove um, like this number here. And then for three or for, I think like this one, this one, this one probably, but like the three of them, we need to use recurrence. And sometimes it's um, recurrence on two, uh, three numbers from like three um, indexes. It's not even just recurrence on one index. Yeah. So we um find it pretty hope uh hopeless to get like just a single formula to to give us yeah. like the probability that any two any pairs will show up before any others. So and yeah, and then for the Markov chain variations, um, we conjectured on this. I mean, we're still working on this, but I'm defending on like two weeks so mm -hmm. i'm not sure if we will have time to figure out um but for so at first we we're thinking of it's probably easier to prove this conjecture here and from here we can hopefully to prove this thing um but 
I um I don't know if we have like a way. At first, we we're thinking of because this probability is in terms of uh like the number of good, so it can be rewrite as number of good works basically. Mm -hmm. So we're we're thinking of oh probably um if we can show that um there are always less number of good works um and with sigma than the number of good works at end with tau. If if we have such conditions, then hopefully um we'll just prove it. But actually sigma um has more number of good works comparing to tau at the beginning. Like when i is less than like three or four. So mm -hmm. and then it kind of alternates, then uh, the number of good works for tau gets larger and then um it gives the the probability here. Yeah. So it yeah, it probably requires other method for which um I don't think I have time to work on this for now. So I just put it as a conjecture, although we really want to prove it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you had your matrix, the, with four length four permutations, the one with colors, um, oh, the colors, the yeah. yeah. So you can imagine that as an adjacency matrix of a directed graph, right? Like what beats what? So, yeah. So if this is cyan, then, uh, uh, this one, two, yeah. three, four will win. And if there's a uh, margin tile, then it's like the the upper column will win. And if it's cyan, then yeah. it's the left yeah, column will win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like you can make it like into a director graph where this wins against this, with this wins against this. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at what the graph looks like and if you can find some patterns in that? Um... Well, like, one conclusion. Yes, one yeah. conclusion we have is this is also a non-transitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So um, one bits to the yeah, like a bits to uh b b bits mm -hmm. c doesn't imply it's like a bits c. So we, it's also non-transitive. Yeah, no, yeah. It's also yeah non-transitive, and um, mm -hmm. that's and then we're just yeah. So you would get like, like a cycle if it's non-transitive. Yes. Maybe if you could. Yeah. 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 It's a, yeah. We have a cycle relationship. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, we use the ordering, which is like the lexicographic ordering on permutations. The lexical. Like the ordering of the permutations. Mm -hmm. The dictionary ordering, like one, two, three, four. Right? Is that the one that's being used? Yeah. Okay, so if you change the ordering, mm -hmm. can you see patterns uh, in the call? I don't know. I didn't. I didn't try it. So, because, yeah, because this seems like super nice and symmetric with the anti diagonal going like this. So, so I, yeah, I mean, we do have like um the the bottom left part is one minus the upper right triangle because either yeah. yeah either one will win so like this area is like one minus this area the data mm -hmm. and then also this area is one minus uh this area because of complement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's probably Oh, it's probably easier to see from like the table of three here. So these two numbers add up to one and five five zero four five zero add up to one. And also these two numbers add up to one. And also um these two numbers. So the only thing interested up to symmetry is basically this upper triangle here. Mm -hmm. Once we have this, we can just use symmetry and then figure out the whole table. But um, if you talk about like and like specific patterns, um, I'm not sure. I didn't really try to rearrange and observe. Okay. Okay. 
Thank you for the question. So I have two more kind of thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, one is, uh, I think I have watched too many combinatorial stocks. And so my instinct here is like, oh, I'm doing something with permutations. And I'm really concerned about one line notation because it's pattern avoidance and whatnot. But mm -hmm. have you looked at these permutations in, uh, you know, Coxeter language? And, you know, just thinking them as products of simple transpositions and just check to see if any patterns just immediately jumped out. Like if one is related to another by in the right week order or something, is that going to tell you something about their probabilities? Because my gut says probably not. Words don't normally interact well with Coxeter permutations, but also I think I've been conditioned to always check. Mm. Can you say more details? Like so, you know, just we we have one line notation for permutations, but we can also think about them as you know, products of simple transpositions. We've got post sets of them. We can think of them as you know, we've got the right weak Bruja order, the left weak Bruja order, mm. and so that gives you a lot of relations between permutations of how are two permutations related. Well, one covers the other in Bruja order or something. One it requires more transpositions to create. Mm. And so I was wondering if any of those might coincidentally, you know, give you some information about your winning probabilities. My gut says mm. no, because one, two, three, and three, two, one behave the same. And yeah. those are very different in Coxeter mm. land. But it's just, yeah. you know, we've got two different ways of looking at permutations and this lives in one land, but I would check to see if the other land has anything interesting happening. I think, yeah. Um, what we've been checked um, before was if we have like equivalence patterns or like mm -hmm. wolf equivalence or like strongly or like super strong wolf equivalence. Mm -hmm. If that gives us any information for like probabilities, but I don't think there's, um, it's not like, guarantee that if these two are equivalent or like the expected the um the expected time to see some pattern for the first time is bigger, then we have that pattern is always winning or like losing or any mm -hmm. um relations for sure. But that's like the only things that we've checked. Um yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. But thank you for the <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely look it up if if that could if that will work. It's a it's just a hazard of watching too many thoughts. <laughs> um the other thing is your la your final conjecture. You said like a non losing strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By Jerry. Mm -hmm. Um, just instinctually when I heard that, like I'm, it made me think, try to find an injection because an injection between your good paths is always going to be a non losing strategy. Mm -hmm. Is that a technique you've looked into for this? But your work for the previous question where the early numbers don't add up makes me a little more suspicious of this yeah i think we definitely try like from from the markov chain side if there's mm -hmm. like a subgraph basically or like anything mm -hmm. similar to that but um mm, okay. yeah but i don't think it gives us like a lot of information that we can um, keep working at least for now so uh, Okay, I've run out of questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, next time we'll speak again. Thank you for listening. Thank you for the talk. Um, yeah. mm -hmm.